Good evening. I have three very important jobs tonight. The first is to ask you to turn off your cell phones. The second is to invite you to a reception following the program in the lobby right out front. And the third is to ask President Mitchell Reese to kick off this evening's programming. Thanks. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this evening's discussion, the latest in a series of talks honoring the memory of the late Richard Harwood. Dick Harwood was a reporter, editor, columnist, and ombudsman whose career spanned five decades and who was known for his tough-minded dedication to high journalistic standards and balanced reporting. When retirement brought him to nearby Langford Creek, he became a friend and supporter of Washington College, serving on our board of visitors and governors, mentoring student journalists, and helping to found the Literary House Press. His legacy endures thanks to the Richard Harwood Endowment, which honors his memory with lectures and discussions on journalism and national affairs, and underwrites internships for student editors. We are equally grateful for our enduring friendship with the Harwood family, including B. Harwood, who is here tonight, Helen Harwood, the mother of Kelly Minchik, a Washington College alumna, and John Harwood, who brings, us, who brings us tonight's discussion with political strategist David Axelrod. John's distinguished career as a Washington correspondent and political editor is outlined in your program. He has covered national politics for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and CNBC, appearing frequently on NBC Nightly News, Meet the Press, and Washington Week. On our campus, he has hosted lively discussions with James Carville, Carl Rove, Howard Dean, John McCain, and many, many others. John received the honorary degree of uh, Doctor of Letters degree from Washington College in 2010, and we are very proud to claim him as an alumnus. John, we thank you for bringing important issues to the table, for bringing distinguished guests to our campus, for sharing your wisdom with all of us, and for keeping the Harwood legacy alive and thriving on our campus. Won't you please join with me in welcoming Mr. John Harwood. Hello. Is this on? Okay. Is mine? I, yeah. I stopped in the restroom before we came in and I was pushing all the buttons to make sure that the mic was muted, so I'm <laughs> relieved. Probably too much information. Um, I'm not going to uh, do a long biographical introduction of David. You know who he is, famous guy. You've got your printed uh, material in front of you. But I just want to tell you a story, um, boring for him because he's heard it a couple of times. But uh, when I first had a conversation with David about Obama, which is really what, what has um, caused the whole country to know both of them, um, I've known David for a long time. He was a reporter. And then in 1987, uh, when I was a political reporter for the St. Petersburg Times, I was covering the 1988 campaign, uh, along with uh, our uh, dear departed friend, Richard Ben Kramer. Uh, uh, could we have one quick round of applause for yes. Richard? I was telling Joni uh, before the event that I was on a campaign bus with Richard, and uh, I told him what I was doing, and then he uh, told me what he was doing, and I said, okay, so your book's coming out next year. This is 87. He said, no, it's coming out uh, five years from now. <laughs> and I was astounded because I just couldn't imagine sustaining a project like that, and you know, wouldn't the material be so old by then? And in fact, um, he produced over that five years what I think everyone who is in our business uh, regards the as, gold the, standard. as the gold standard of uh, books because of its, the depth of the reporting and the humanity of the reporting. That is, he, he portrayed the people involved, um, the politicians involved, as 
flesh and blood human beings um, in ways that contemporary media doesn't really permit or, or just doesn't do anymore. And so it was incredibly valuable. But anyway, David but was... The, just, just, just to yeah. say one word on that. And I was involved in that campaign yeah. because I was working for one of the candidates, Paul Simon. Um, but the portraits of the, these people who were running for president were so insightful. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were so spot on. That, that that was what was breathtaking to me, is the, the depth of understanding and the ability to bring these people to life in that way. It's something I, I deeply admire. Well, that's, so that's when I got to know David, uh, not as a, a fellow journalist, but as the media advisor, or communications guy for Paul Simon. Just interesting digression. I ran into Paul Simon's son, Martin, who's a photographer at the White House the other day, and, um, and I, uh, uh, remind, we, we talked a little bit about that moment, and I, I told him that I'd heard a uh, newsreader on NPR over the weekend refer, mistakenly introduced Scott Simon, the host of Weekend Edition, as Paul Simon. <laughs> and Martin said, you know, that's a funny story because Paul Simon, the singer, was a supporter uh, of our campaign in 1987 and 88, um, and he used to refer to my dad who was, what, 5'8"? Yeah. As the big tall Paul. Paul Simon. Big Paul. <laughs> yeah. And don't think Senator Simon didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but so David worked for Simon in that campaign, and uh, I, I uh, talked to him as a source and a, um, an analyst of politics for the work that I did over a number of years. And there were, we had a conversation in 2004. Uh, it was in the wintertime. Uh, and he was working at that time for John Edwards, who was running against John Kerry for the Democratic nomination. And I thought John Edwards, I, I wasn't aware of like character issues with him, I thought he was an enormously gifted politician. And I, I thought he had a chance to really go a long way in politics, and David and I were talking about this on the phone. And he said, by the way, just want to let you know, I'm working for somebody in another race in Illinois who's better than John Edwards. And I said, really? Who is that? He said, well, he's a, he's a state senator, uh, and he's running for the Senate. Yeah? OK. That didn't sound very extraordinary. Um, and I said, what else about him? He said, well, he's black. I said, wow. That's kind of, that's significant. What's his name? And he said, well, his name's Barack Obama. And my answer was, get out of town. <laughs> you can't elect statewide in a big state like Illinois a black guy whose name is Barack Obama. That's just not going to happen. And he said, well, maybe, but I, I just um, I want you to meet him. And so a few months later, after Edwards had left the race, and I think at that time, you know, one of David's subsequent colleagues in um, the White House, Anita Dunn, who's a, another Democratic consultant, was working for Blair Hull, who was the, I think he was the front runner, I think. Yeah, well, he spent $30, he billion, uh, $30 million, that can make Yeah, you well, they had vanquished Blair formidable. Hull uh, in the primary. And I, I met uh, Obama when he was in Washington to raise money. This is before the big convention speech. And I remember thinking after spending an hour talking to Obama at that point that he like lived up to what David had said in terms of uh, how he thought, how he talked, how he uh, carried himself, the nature of his appeal. Um, and so, you know, from there to here, Obama's now gotten elected twice uh, to national office. And I guess what I wanted to kick off and get David talking about initially was um, at that moment, uh, or at that, at that point, bef even before he got into the race, you had a sense of possibility for him on something that many people, by the nature of their experience and what they thought they knew about race and politics in the country, thought that was not possible. Tell me how that snuck up on everybody and how it became possible. Well, in terms of how it snuck up on everybody, I always quote, uh, the guy we were talking about earlier, Gary Hart, who ran for president in the 80s, 
almost toppled the, presume, the pr presumptive nominee uh, for president. He once told me, what, just remember, Washington's always the last to get the news. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, in terms of Obama, you know, my first encounter with Obama was in 1992. He had just come back from law school to Chicago. He was running a voter registration drive. And a woman in Chicago named Betty Lou Saltzman, who's a very close friend of mine, very active Democrat uh, there, called me and said, I just met the most extraordinary young man, and I think you ought to meet him. Uh, and I said, I I'm happy to meet, and she's, I said, I'm happy to meet anybody you want to meet, Betty Lou, but why? Uh, why are you so intent on my meeting him? She said, I know this sounds weird, but I think he could be President of the United States someday. 1992. So now when I go to the track, I take Betty Lou with me <laughs> uh, whenever I go. But well, remember, uh, that was four years after Willie Horton in yes. the 1988 campaign, and yes. people think that race is a powerful barrier. Yes, and, and, and undoubtedly it was. I have made a career, a lot of my career I've worked for African-American candidates running in sort of these barrier-breaking uh, races, and I was both a reporter covering Harold Washington when he ran for mayor of Chicago, and then I worked for him in his uh, reelect. And you know, there was enorm there were enormous, there was enormous resistance. And uh, so, um, but um, fast forward, I became friendly with Obama. Didn't work for him when he ran for the state senate. He didn't need my help. Didn't work for him when he ran for Congress because uh, he was running against. Uh, someone who had just run against Mayor Daley in Chicago, and I, Daley was my client, would have looked like retribution, so I, I didn't uh, work in that race. He lost that race. And so in the summer of 2002, um, I, we were both in this kind of existential moment in our careers. Uh, he had lost this race, and he was in this sort of up or out mode. He had told Michelle, he told me that uh, uh, he was going to try one more time and if it didn't work out that he was going to give up running for public office because he had a young family, it was a great sacrifice, and uh, he knew that he, he needed to do that for them. Um, I, you already mentioned John Edwards, so let me uh, f uh, further, um, uh, I don't want to say sully my reputation, but uh, <laughs> by, by saying that I also worked when he was a younger guy for Rod Blagojevich when he was running for, for him. It's always worth a laugh. Uh, I'll tell you about Elliot Spitzer later. Uh, and, uh, but Rod was a state representative. He ran for Congress. I represented him in, the, in those races. And then he came to me in 2001 said so he wanted to run for governor. And I was kind of appalled by that prospect. Uh, you know, it's one thing to help a guy get elected. I, I liked him. He was sort of a roguish guy, but he, he had a good middle class sort of sense, uh, sensibility. Uh, but he was running to be one of 435 people, so mm -hmm. you know, there's a safety net there. Uh, now he wants to run for governor. So, so, by the way, does that mean you hold blameless the Republican uh, consultants who put all those members of the Tea Party caucus in who frustrate Obama on every single thing he wants to try to do? No. <laughs> no. Uh, so, um, so I said to Blagojevich, well, why do you want to run for governor? And he said, well, you can help me figure that out. <laughs> and I said, look, if I have to help you figure it out, you shouldn't run because, you know, I can help you communicate what you believe, but I can't, I can't tell you. But he found others who were more willing. And um, by the summer of 2002, it was clear he was going to win. They had run the state-of-the-art campaign. He was... Um, ironically now, in re retrospect, and to me then, running as a reformer, mm -hmm. because you know our previous governor had gone to prison too. So, <laughs> not It's a, happened to most of them, hasn't it? Well, yeah, it's a problem in the land of Lincoln that, uh, <laughs> that we have. Um, our current governor is uh, unindicted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so, but I was very depressed about this, because I really got into politics uh, as an idealist. I mean, I was a little boy when I was five years old. I sat on a mailbox and watched as John F. Kennedy came to Stuyvesant Town, where I grew up in New York City, uh, 10 days before the 1960 election. And I got the bug, and I was 
passionate and inter passionately interested about pol in politics <laughs> ever since, and I believed in it. And I still, you know, I, I I didn't think of it as a business. I wasn't cynical about it. And I thought, well, if this is the state of the art, maybe I better get out. And I heard Barack was going to run for the Senate, and I called him, and we we started a conversation about this. And he was by no means a frontline candidate for all the reasons that you mm -hmm. said. We were one. Not only was he African American, very progressive. Uh, but he also, uh, uh, this was one year after, uh, uh, after 9-11, and he had this name Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, you know, so there were a lot of reasons to mm -hmm. doubt. Uh, and, um, uh, but I really felt, and I went home and I said to my wife, Susan, you know, if I could help, I really believed in him. I th if I could help him get elected to U.S. Senate, I really would feel like I've done something good, something valuable. And so we started on this road, uh, trying to persuade people that this was plausible. But he, you know, you learn about people in campaigns. And here's what I learned very quickly. He went down to Southern Illinois, that is uh, uh, campaigning in towns that were closer to Little Rock than Chicago. And I'd get calls from these, this kid who would travel with him saying, gee, we had a great day. I said, really? Yeah, you know, we had, you know, we went into these little churches and VFW halls and they, they just loved him. And, um, you know, I would talk to uh, Barack at night and I'd say, Jay, I heard you had a good day down there. And he could detect the element of surprise in my voice. And he said, why do you sound so surprised? I said, I don't know, you know, a black guy named Barack Obama in deep southern Illinois. It just seems like it, it could be challenging. And he said, no, no, you don't get it. These folks down here, they're just like my grandparents from Kansas. He said, we talk about my grandfather and his time in Patton's army and my grandmother who was a Rosie the Riveter. And, you know, we get, it's, we get along great. And I realized over time, this is a guy who felt comfortable in any room in which he walked, whether it was in deep southern Illinois or in uh, a, a Tony suburb or in an inner city church. And that was an extraordinary uh, gift, and because he felt comfortable with people, they felt comfortable uh, with him. So, you know, I saw the skills evidence themselves, and then, you know, there were other things. In October of 2002, I guess, uh, when the resolution was being voted on on Iraq, uh, every Democrat in the race for the Senate in Illinois endorsed it, every major Democrat, mm -hmm. and every, obviously uh, Republicans as well. Uh, and it was very popular. Uh, and he was invited to speak at an anti-war rally. And he accepted this invitation. And he wrote a, a speech out the night before that I didn't see. Mm -hmm. um, and Did you went, advise him not to speak? No, I no. thought it was, I, th I thought it was, this is what he believed. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to me, you know, everything we were doing was sort of a, a gamble. So um, I, I thought we, bet we ought to ride our, our principles. And, um, and he went out there, and um, my wife and my son were there. I wasn't there. And they came back and said, gee, Barack made a great speech. And it was only uh, after the fact uh, uh, that I realized how prescient it was. And like it, when we went back and he was running for president, I went back and, and looked at this speech. And it was the most uh, acute uh, analysis of what was going to happen or what, what would come. And he did that, you know, sort of on the fly. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up winning that primary. Uh, we thought we needed 38% of the vote to win because there were seven candidates, including the guy who was spending $30, 30 million dollars. Felt like a 30 billion to me, but <laughs> it's only 30 million. And um, he, um, and we ended up on election night getting 53% of the mm -hmm. vote. And what was remarkable about it was that we, we were getting votes from places I never imagined he could do uh, well in. And one of them was the northwest side of Chicago. When Harold Washington made, ran for mayor 20 years earlier, uh, he got virtually no votes on the northwest side of Chicago. He went, in fact, with Walter Mondale, who was the presumptive Democratic nominee for president in 1983, to a church on the northwest side of Chicago called St. Pascal's. Catholic Church, and it was, it was a national story because the crowds outside, you may remember, were mm -hmm. so ugly and so uh, uh, vile, really, 
that, that it was reminiscent of scenes from the 1950s and 1960s South. And uh, the night that uh, Obama won that uh, primary, I went and I looked up the precinct in which that church sat, and I saw that he'd carried that precinct. And I said to him, you know, Harold's smiling down on us uh, tonight. But it was, it was partly that uh, Chicago changed, America changed, but it was partly this guy who had the ability to break down uh, these barriers. And then, of course, the great revelation was the speech, the convention speech mm -hmm. in 2004. You didn't think when you asked me this question that it would take up the entire rest of the thing. <laughs> but, well, but, uh, no, I do want to ask you one thing, though. That wasn't Can't, an invitation to break in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, accepted. Um, the, um, given the instincts that he had and the life experience that made him comfortable in all those different rooms, reflecting broadly, not in that campaign, you know, in a narrow sense, but when you think about what you were able to give him, what, what your unique contribution to this immensely talented person was across these campaigns, what was it? I was a um, warm and amusing companion. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a hard question, actually, um, because I don't think of it in those terms. But, you know, I had a lot of experience in campaigns, and as I mentioned, I had a lot of experience working with African-American candidates mm -hmm. in campaigns. I understood um, the kinds of signals and cues that had to be sent. For example, I don't think newspaper endorsements are generally all that impactful on voters, mm -hmm. but when you have an African-American candidate running for the first, running in a, in, a, in, a, in a majority white venue, and you have voters who'd never voted for an African-American candidate for a major office before, having that approbation, the affirmation of newspapers, was really important. It was a goal of ours from the very beginning to make sure that we ran the table on all the newspaper endorsements mm -hmm. in the state and that we would, and we used them uh, on TV. You know, I used um, the tools that I had become accustomed to to kind of understand our target voters and what would motivate them. One interesting dilemma we had, we really, our, our mission was to marry the substantial African-American base in the primary uh, in, in Illinois, which is about a quarter of the vote, with the progressive white vote along the lakefront and in the suburbs. And that was how, how we were going to get to our 38 percent, more or less. Um, and for those progressive white voters, uh, Paul Simon, the aforementioned Paul Simon, was a great hero, and deservedly so. And I had been working, as had some other friends of Paul's, working on him throughout previous year to endorse Barack, even though he was close to a number of the people in the race. And I told him, you know, this Paul was a guy who fought for civil rights from southern Illinois, very difficult in the 1950s, very courageous, very progressive. I said, you know, Barack, and he, and he knew Barack well. He was a mentor of his. I said, you know, this guy is the personification of everything that you've fought for. And so he called me in the fall of 2003 and said, you know, I've decided you're right. I'm going to endorse Barack, so anytime you want to go. I said, Paul, let's do it after the first of the year because people aren't yet focused. The primary was in March. And he went in for heart surgery in early December and never came out of the hospital. And so, the, and, and, and we knew from the research we were doing that the only thing that some of these voters in the northern suburbs and along Chicago's lakefront needed to hear was, Paul Simon endorsed this candidate. It was an endorsement that really mattered. So um, I had this thought that um, we could convey it in a different way. And I did an ad with Paul's daughter, uh, 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 who is now, Sheila, who's now the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. And uh, Paul, uh, Sheila, um, um, she, she looked a lot like Paul, although prettier. Um, <laughs> And um, I don't know if you guys remember Paul, but Paul had distinctive look. He was sort of the Orville Redenbacher of, <laughs> had a bow tie and horn rim glasses, big ears. Excellent ears. Big ears, yes. We used to joke uh, behind his back about Paul Simon's plan for lobal domination. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but Senator she, Al Franken used to do a killer he did. Paul Simon uh, on Saturday Night Live. On Saturday Night Live. Um, so, um, so I asked Sheila to do this ad, and it started off with old footage of Paul Simon, and she talked about what Paul Simon represented, and then she said, 
uh, Senator Barack Obama's cut from the same cloth and we had footage of Obama and she told his story and then she said um, uh, Barack Obama will be a senator in the Paul Simon tradition and then we revealed her and she said uh, you know I know because Paul Simon was my dad and it was very impactful mm -hmm. and um, so those kinds of things were yeah. the things that I could do for him. I'll tell you one other story from that in the interest of seeing how long I can run the clock here. <laughs> um, but also, it's, I, it's, a, it's a story, it's a, it's a good story. The first ad I ever did for Paul Simon uh, was when he was running for the Senate. And um, it, was a, it was a bio spot, but it was him telling his story of all the barriers that he had broken, both in his personal uh, life, but in, uh, also in the... Um, in, the, in his work as a legislator. So, you know, first black president of the Harvard Law Review. It was all they said it couldn't be done mm -hmm. and we did it. And it finished with now they say we can't change Washington. I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message to say, yes, we can. It was the first time we ever used that mm -hmm. phrase. So we're first take of the speech, of the ad, he gets to the end and he does it. And then he turns to me and says, yes, we can, yes, we can. He says, is that too corny? And um, he, Michelle was sitting there, and she, uh, he turned to her and said, Mish, uh, is that too corny? And she just shook her and said, not too corny. And so he didn't trust me, but he certainly trusted her. <laughs> and so we went ahead, and I thought about that years later uh, during the uh, Arab Spring, because I saw a guy in Trarier Square, young guy holding up a sign saying, yes, we can too. And I thought, thank God for Michelle Obama, because mm -hmm. if she hadn't done that, this poor kid wouldn't have anything to put yeah, on his yeah. son. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to come back to you in a minute on the question of whether you're um, satisfied that uh, you've changed Washington as successfully as you won those elections. But, it's like uh, a rhetorical question, isn't it? Uh, no, it, it will be a real question. Um, but, but I want to, you know, what, the, the, what we call this uh, program was upside down, politics, Barack Obama, and changing. America, and one of the things that I think Obama has consistently done or participated in are things that surprised us about what was possible. And I want to ask you about what's going on right now with the issue of um, gay rights, gay marriage. Um, Ob uh, uh, Obama, with a little prodding from Joe Biden, uh, came out in favor of gay marriage uh, last year. Um, it actually from where I sat, helped your campaign rather than hurt your campaign, which is something that a lot of us had assumed for a long time. Um, you, had, you had this uh, breakthrough just the other day when an NBA basketball player came out, said he was gay, treated to tremendous coverage about heroic breakthrough and all that sort of thing. Do you think yourself and Barack Obama as well uh, underestimated the flimsiness of that barrier? And in other words, could, is that something that you could have, with no fear of huge political fallout, done in 2008 as well as you could have done in 2012? Or how, how do you see that process having unfolded? Well, first of all, I just want to challenge one mm -hmm. small assertion of yours. Mm -hmm. um, and I do so with respect for Joe Biden, who is uh, a great guy, and you knew you were jabbing me when yeah. you said that. But... Um, uh, uh, the president had made clear to all of us that he was going to take the position that he ultimately took and that he was going to choose the right time and place. And uh, So just to, just to translate for everybody, the idea that that happened because of Biden's uh, slip of the tongue is false. Yeah, and I don't know whether it was a slip of the tongue on Biden's part or not, but it was, it was the fact that we were... In, within a short period of time going to do that. So, um, and I think the vice president knew that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in, in terms of your larger question, I think that um, attitudes have shifted on this as quickly as any issue uh, that I've seen. Uh, I think they're far different now even than they were in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the president has had something to do with that, and not just what he said on the issue of gay marriage, but also the two-year battle he waged to end the don't ask, don't tell policy, the decision of the administration to um, uh, uh, withdraw its representation on the, for the DOMA uh, law, 
uh, I, I think that uh, there have been a series of things that have uh, contributed to that. So I don't know how to, I don't know how to measure the, you know, I've, you can take polling and mm -hmm. you can see that attitudes have shifted dramatically since that time. One of the things that I'm proud of is that uh, the president um, took the position uh, he took, and you saw some significant shifts um, uh, among uh, constituencies, uh, the base constituencies for him uh, on this issue. Mm -hmm. And you saw it, I think, here in Maryland, it was a, a factor uh, in that. So um, I do think that, um, uh, that he's played a, a leadership role on this, but I also think the country was, you know, it, this was going to happen over right. time. Uh, because you look at the break, it's really people over 65 who, uh, where there's a sharp uh, uh, descent on this issue. And as you move down, there's more and more acceptance, as you'd expect. So mm -hmm. among people under 30, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, uh, there's strong majority support for this. Do you look at any other uh, things in our politics right now? Just take as a random example the idea that a woman could be president, but not only that and say, that's something that looks like a barrier, but if you actually blow on it, it's a piece of paper and it's gonna fall over and it's not that significant. Well, you know, I, I guess every barrier looks weak when it collapses. Uh, but it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it was always weak. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things I always remember was that, uh, I mean, uh, the barrier, I don't think it was an insignificant barrier that uh, uh, we had never had an African-American president before uh, when Obama ran uh, for president. I do remember our conversation when he was thinking about running and Michelle asked him, uh, are there things that you, what, what could you do that others couldn't do? And one of the things that he said was, look, I don't know, that's a tough question, but I know this, that the day I take office, I think there are millions of kids who are going to look at themselves differently. And I believe that that absolutely is the case. So, you know, um, I think that the barrier was hard and it took time, you know, just the distance from Harold Washington, St. Pascal's Church to that Senate race. I mean, these things take uh, time, but I think once those, the barrier is broken, you know, it's broken forever. It encourages it encourages young young people, and you know you accelerate that uh, that movement, and it's no longer a uh, so what's a, a next discussion to, point. What's next to crumble? Well, I mean, there are plenty of barriers in our society. Obviously, as you point out, we've never had a a, a woman president. We've never had a Hispanic uh, president. We've never had an Asian American. Uh, president, and it's not just that. I mean, there are barriers at all levels. Mm -hmm. I was really proud uh, to be a part of the group that uh, helped uh, uh, with the nomination of uh, Sonia Sotomayor to the Supreme Court. I think that was an important, uh, uh, an important barrier. I think it makes the court more representative. She's a fine uh, jurist, and as her book reflects, a great person and mm -hmm. a great role model. Um, so. I think that um, uh, we are going to become, we are on a journey and we are going to become a more inclusive, tolerant uh, society as time goes on. Um, so I want to talk about what, another surprise that happened and juxtapose that with where we are right now um, uh, in May of 2013. So the president ran for re-election, having shattered that barrier, running in a... Uh, pretty weak economy, not terrible, but weak, um, at a time when a lot of people thought it was going to be difficult. And you, we had a running argument, uh, those of us covering the campaign over polling and samples and what, what the electorate was going to turn out to be. And uh, We're talking uh, about 2008 now? No, no, we're talking about 2012. Oh, yes. And, uh, and your side turned out to have a, a clear and accurate picture of what the electorate was going to be and executed along yeah. that. And a lot of other we, people. We were right. Yes, I, I, I've, I've gotten that. Um, so tell me, and, and you were right in a way that was pretty decisive. You won over 300 electoral votes. You won almost all the big swing states. Yeah, I mean, I, just to yeah. underscore the point, Barack Obama's only the sixth president in history to get reelected 
to get elected and reelected with more than 51% of the vote. Right. Very, very rare. Um, and a lot of people woke up after the election and said, well, not only did that happen, but look at the Republican Party and look how weak they are. Look, look at how their uh, national approval rating in our NBC Wall Street Journal poll has been underwater for six years in a row. Very, very bad. So, get to May 1st. How is it that you get to an issue like background checks on guns where 90% of the American people are for you, you have won this election, the opposition is in the dumps, and you can't get the votes you need to get the thing on the floor in the Senate. What, explain to average people how that could be. You're saying these are average people? <laughs> they look like above average people to me. Well, well imagine that uh, they were average people, <laughs> and then explain to them. Um, well, I want to say two things about this. First of all, we have this uh, dichotomy in our politics. You know, the day uh, after the midterm elections in 2010, which were, um, you know, devastating for us, a lot of crepe being hung around, um, I uh, said to the president, I think the seeds of your reelection have been planted. And he looked at me like I was nuts. And That was I, not a joke, I take it. You, no, you were serious. Yeah. I was serious about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it reminds me of the old story uh, when Churchill uh, lost the uh, prime ministership after he led Britain through the war, and someone said, it's a blessing in disguise, and he said, well, it's rather well disguised. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, the reason I believe that was because it was clear that the uh, Republican Party had, that the new Republican Party had been shifted even further to the right, and that whoever was going to run for president was going to have to pass through the, uh, the Tea Party social conservative toll booths and was going to have to pay for that nomination in ways that would make it very hard to win a general election. And that's exactly what happened. Now, um, you know, the Republican, the Republican caucuses in Congress are dominated by those voices and they dominate a region. The Republican Party today is a at its core a, uh, a mostly Southern, uh, white, uh, old evangelical party. And that is enough to dominate, especially because they did a good job of controlling state houses and legislatures, that's enough to dominate congressional elections in the states where they uh, hold sway. And uh, so you have a party that is capable of, uh, of controlling at least the House of Congress, uh, but is incapable of winning a, a general election for president. And they have to find a way to reconcile that. So let's park that and get back to your question on guns. Um, I think there's an important principle here that everyone needs to absorb, which is that the first rule of politics for most people who hold public office is survival. Now, John F. Kennedy wrote a book called Profiles and Courage, and those guys were in there um, because what they did was unusual. Uh, if everybody was willing to at least in their own perception, risk their political careers uh, for a principle, then Profiles and Courage wouldn't have been a very good book. Uh, and um, yes, 90% of the public supports uh, background checks. I am strongly among them. Uh, but until people start losing their offices because they take that position, I think that they're gonna, the NRA is still going to be able to influence a lot of votes because the NRA threatens people, threatens their uh, threatens their reelection, and uh, particularly in those states, mm -hmm. rural states, and uh, states where they they, they are uh, particularly strong. And there's no evidence yet that people have lost their jobs because they've taken the other position. Mm -hmm. So my advice to my friends in the in the uh, in the movement for background checks and other common sense gun laws is to um, is to organize uh, as the NRA does and make sure that those who feel strongly about this issue know about it, vote on it, it's, and make it a voting issue. Let me ask you though. And there are, by the way, districts in this country. There are three around Philadelphia. There are some in Jersey, California. Uh, you know, there are plenty of places where there are <coughs> Republicans holding uh, seats in, in, what, in the you know, handful of swing districts, districts that are left who are, uh, I think, vulnerable on this issue. 
But let's, let's talk about what just happened in the Senate, though. Um, your party has 55 votes in the Senate, controls the Senate. Um, you had a conservative Republican making common cause with a, with a conservative Democrat uh, on the issue. Um, and why is it that a president with Obama's intelligence and skill w was not able to get all of his own party and enough to get over the finish line. You know, you, there's a critique, and I know I know you're going to reject the critique, but I want to. I, I'd like to hear. I think people would like to hear I, well, let me what the basis of own. it is, which is that, you know, if if Lyndon Johnson were president, <laughs> he'd know the pressure points of those people. He would get right up in their face. He would know how to uh, make them fear that they were going to lose their seat if they weren't going to get something that they wanted. Yes. And he would get those votes. Yes. And and you didn't, for yes. example. Uh, the president didn't get the vote of Heidi Heitkamp, a female Democrat just elected with Obama in the past election. So respond to that. Well, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have great reverence for the legislative skills of Lyndon Johnson. He was a master. I mean, there are, uh, Robert Caro's now in his 16th volume on this very <laughs> subject. <laughs> All of which, Every by the one way, of them is great. Riveting, riveting. I can't wait for the next one. But, uh, 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 but you know, as his current volume reflects, I mean, he came to office in, a, in an unusual time mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, successor to a martyred president, took his program uh, and passed it. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, who is, you know, revered as another master, um, uh, uh, took on Congress on the Supreme Court in 1938, never passed a major piece of domestic legislation again for the rest of his uh, presidency. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of mythology that grows mm -hmm. up around people. The fact is Barack Obama passed a health care law that uh, presidents back to Teddy Roosevelt have been trying to pass. He uh, uh, did a series of things that were very Hard to if do. If only he had Bill Clinton skills, he might have had a better bill. <laughs> well, don't. No, no need to rehash all yeah, of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm Clinton the, didn't I pass to, the bill. I have to put my own head on a seven second delay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, in this case, I, I said the morning of the vote, we're either going to get 60 votes for this or we're going to be in the low 50s. Because I knew that there were members of our, our, we got 90% of the Democrats. You I actually knew, woke up that day not knowing how, many, how the votes were going to fall? I, I, I didn't, but I'm not in the White House anymore. I'm well, not sure no, anybody but did. You, I'm not but sure do you think the White House knew how the votes were going to fall? Well, I think that there was not great optimism right. uh, that morning. And I wasn't optimistic yeah. uh, that morning. Um, I th but I, th you know, I think the key moment was when uh, Senator Ayotte from uh, New Hampshire, who was considered someone who might vote for this legislation, uh, voted against because it became clear that you, we, we weren't going to get to 60. And, you know, the basic rule of politics on the Hill is don't walk the plank for a losing vote. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure that we wouldn't have gotten all or most of those Democrats, the handful who didn't mm -hmm. vote, 90 percent did vote for it. Um, and I'm not sure, and, and I think the president would have asked them for those votes if we saw an opportunity to pass the bill and the opportunity wasn't there. Now, I don't know what happened, but this, this is my surmise. And if I were president, I'm not sure that I would have asked them to walk the plank either. Now, I hope that there's another uh, vote on this. I, I'm, I recall the fact that the Brady Law took seven different attempts before uh, it was passed. So sometimes these things take years uh, to pass. Um, the real question is, why is it the Republican Party voted 90 percent uh, against? Uh, and Senator Toomey, I give him all the credit in the world from Pennsylvania for doing what he did. It was also incredibly shrewd politics on his part because, uh, as I mentioned, there are th the, the areas around Philadelphia, the mm -hmm. suburban areas, are, are more moderate Republican areas where there is strong support for this. He's a more conservative Republican. There's no doubt in my mind that he fortified himself right. uh, for the future, but he couldn't bring along... Uh, you know, but a few of his colleagues. And um, so our ability to reach into that group it has been limited. Do you personally, as you reflect on how that whole thing went down, um, uh, think there's anything that your side, the president, could have 
uh, done more effectively? You know, there's the you, tougher. You know, no, no. I, look, I don't think there's any. I think the president what? was. I don't think this was a matter of schmoozing. I don't think it was a matter of toughness. I, I think the president was very, very vigorous on behalf of this and very, you know, very connected emotionally uh, with this. I mean, I can tell you that no, nothing I nothing gets to him more than uh, a child in distress and the loss of these children, and frankly, the loss every day of children all over this country uh, to gun violence, or violence generally, is something that is very close to him and he cares deeply about. I don't think any of that. I mean, the one question that's been raised is, should there have been a lightning strike after Newtown? Should there have been a vote? Mm -hmm. But that really doesn't, uh, I'd say two things about that. One is, uh, remember at the time we were in the midst of uh, a big battle mm -hmm. over whether or not taxes were going to mm -hmm. go up on January 1st. And it was an all-consuming mm -hmm. battle. Secondly, the nature of the, as you know, John, because you've covered this, the nature of these institutions, and particularly the Senate, is it's not built for lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. It is built to slow down the process. What is it built for, exactly? Um, <laughs> that's a, you sound like the average American. Um, but um, so I, I don't, I, I, so, I sort of discount that as, as well. I just think that uh, we have to keep plugging away at that issue. The president got a question in his news conference. It may be, by the way, that after Republicans are through their filing process for the next election cycle and they know whether or not they have primary challengers, you may pry a few more loose. Is that one actually, you know, there's been a lot of talk about is there a second wind, a second attempt on this issue? Uh, is it that, is the thinking that uh, clear that, that that might be the moment. I'm just is throwing it out there. I don't know if I don't I don't know what the uh, calculus is. I saw Senator Manchin the other day suggest there'll be other votes on this. I don't think this issue is going to go away though. Right. It's so fundamentally um, uh, commonsensical and beyond which, you know, I would love to sit here and say we're not going to face other tragedies, but I know that's not true. And the truth is, I come from uh, you know an urban area where. Um, the gun violence is a, is, is a, uh, an ongoing problem. I see grieving mothers on television almost every night. And um, we should remember that, that the, 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 the Newtown tragedy was the most appalling thing I could imagine. The Newtown parents are as valiant as any group of people that I've seen because they've lost their children and yet they're willing to share their stories and give of themselves to try and save other people's children. And I admire them for that. But um, uh, if, you want to ha if, you, if you want to know how significant an issue this is, then just go to any urban area, turn on television, any news broadcast, and likely you'll see some grieving mother who's lost a child to gun violence. The, um, the president got a question in his news conference yesterday from um, my colleague John Carl of ABC, which was, um, does this show you don't have any juice left? To what degree do you look at moments like this, victories, defeats, and see them as emblematic of a larger kind of force of a presidency? And to what degree are they all about very discrete issues and a loss on one thing? A loss on guns doesn't tell you anything about whether he can get a grand bargain, which isn't going to tell you anything about whether he can get an immigration bill. Well, I think that, I, I believe what you just said. I, I think the immigration bill has a life of its own. The only linkage I see, and I said this uh, at the time of the gun vote, was I had a concern that, uh, before the gun vote I said this, that there were some Republicans who think they'll, they get one hall pass from the conservative right, uh, and they were going to use it for uh, and they had already calculated they might have to use it for immigration reform, so they were afraid to take, uh, uh, you know, to, to take too much license and vote for this. Uh, do you this think that's vote. actually the calculation that some people? I make? do, I really do. Yeah, I do. Okay, I, so, uh, but, so. Uh, but I but look, there. Were, how many times was the health care bill declared dead and Obama's presidency declared in ruins? Many, many, you know. Um, uh, he was the only guy who uh, was undeterred, and you know there were plenty of people counseling him to give up, and he and he uh, and he never did. I remember 
uh, sitting in his office when, uh, in the midst of one of these dark days, and he said to his legislative director, Phil Shalero, mm -hmm. you may know, mm -hmm. Uh, Phil, what, what do you think, honestly, what the odds of us getting this done are? And Phil said, well, it depends how lucky you feel, Mr. President. And the president just laughed and said, Phil, I'm a black guy named Barack Hussein Obama, and I'm president of the United States. He said, I feel lucky every day. So, um, uh, but you know, Washington is all about sort of instant measurements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and uh, most of the time they're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think and I hope that there's a, a real opportunity here for immigration reform to pass. That's going to change the narrative. And, you know, something else will happen and that will change it back. Uh, some issues are harder than others. Um, you know, and some, some come to fruition over time for, reason, you know, a variety of reasons. I think the last election made the passage of immigration reform a lot more possible. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think I will never win this uh, debate with my friends in the fourth estate. Mm -hmm. But I think a little restraint is in order mm -hmm. in terms of making these instant judgments about the uh, efficacy of a president or whether he's lo has his juice, lost his juice. You know, um, well, let me ask you about a different metric then. Mm -hmm. When you and I talked in Chicago in February, you said the most important thing was when Republicans calculated that it was going to be in their interest to work with the president. And at that time, there were hopes that that would happen not only on immigration, but on some other things as well. Tell me what cues you see, what signals you see from Republicans about the degree to which they uh, appear to believe they should. Well, you know, here I think you have, this relates to something I said earlier. I think the Republicans spend a lot of time looking over their right shoulder. And, you know, one of the problems we've had, and we've discussed this, is you have, because of redistricting and the way it's done now and the refined way it's done now, uh, you, you know, 80% of the Congress never faces, perhaps more, never faces a, a primary, uh, anything but a primary election. Mm -hmm. They they don't have a general election because their districts are so homogenous that whoever the Democratic nominee wins the Democratic district, whoever the Republican nominee wins the Republican-dominated district, and there's no impetus uh, to reach across. There's only fear of what will happen um, if you affront what the most strident voices in your own party. And uh, we're early in the campaign season now, uh, and so there's you know, a great deal of fear, I think, on the part of uh, some Republicans that if they uh, show too much uh, in the way of cooperation, if they reach out too far, that uh, that will occasion challenges. Well, does that mean that what you just described, the looking over your rights? I think, by the way, that's less, you know, obviously that's less true in the Senate where people are on uh, six-year uh, cycles. And I think right. although the Senate's where you just had that that gun yes, no, I know. I understand. I understand. So it's um, uh, that is it's still, you know, it's still problematical. I'm not saying it's it's not, but it's a bit. At least there are com there there are more there are easier conversations there. Well, if um, uh, if, but, if but but John, one of the things that again, you know, the Republican Party has to decide. Um, the Republican Party has to decide. Uh, who it is and whether or not satisfying its base um, and the most strident voices uh, within its base is uh, a prescription for success. And um, uh, I think that, you know, as you point out, their numbers are atrocious. Mm -hmm. um, their brand is in tatters. I don't think they're going to solve it by getting better technologists. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things you say, well, Obama just had better analytics guys. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. Analytics guys can help you if you're poised to win. It's like if you're on your own 20-yard line, your field goal team isn't going to help you. Mm -hmm. You've got to get down the field. <laughs> and they have to decide whether they want to charge down the field or not. When you think about the, the moment that we're in, the, the, the nature of the two parties, how the country's changing, um, and this question of whether they're going to get beyond their base, does that remind you of any particular point in history when you think about past elections, even ones that you went through as a Democrat when Democrats were losing 
the presidency or anything that you've read about in the past? Well, we marched through a pretty arid desert there in the 1980s, you know. Uh, and um, you had a couple one-state presidential elections. Yeah, which, you know, really trains the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, you know, the way the country is divided, it's not, it's that kind of a, that kind of result is almost impossible now. But it's not impossible that uh, you could have a, uh, a, a, you know, yet another, I mean, I thought we won a substantial victory. You could have an even more uh, substantial victory, depending on who the Republican Party nominates. Uh, and I say this on the day that reports surface that Senator Cruz from Texas is thinking of running for president. So that would test the proposition about just how big a blowout you can have. Well, uh, yeah. um, r related question though to, to what you just said. You, you, your analytics guys can't help you if you're on your own 20 yard line. And it's a marginal contribution that they can make. And I, I always thought this was one of the flaws in the idea that technicians are what, what won the presidency for Obama. If you didn't have Obama and the things that Obama evoked, the technicians couldn't, didn't, wouldn't have anything to deliver. Right. So, and we what, should elaborate on their job was to help us um, identify and motivate those voters who were for Obama or who would be for Obama, to target those voters who were likely to come to uh, Obama. But if Obama weren't, if he didn't have that appeal, if he didn't have that base, um, they, they would not have won the election right. for him. Well, so, but by that logic, how confident can Democrats be that when Obama's not on the ballot, when it's not an election about Obama, that the same things that knit together this coalition that won two presidential elections will even be present for the next Democrat? Well, I think there are structural advantage to the, advantages to the Democratic Party right now. Um, the, a broader coalition, uh, in part because of the way the Republican Party has positioned itself, in part because of the things that Obama has done and the party has done, um, that are going to um, give uh, an advantage. And you know, one of the things that, one of the arguments that we had, not you and I, but uh, our campaign and some others, uh, in, the, in the media and the Republican campaign was over what the structure of the electorate mm -hmm. would look like. And what we looked at were the historic trends. And every single year, um, the, uh, uh, the country's become more diverse. Mm -hmm. Every single quad, I should say every four years, the country's been uh, more diverse. The electorate's been more diverse. We've been gaining, you know, minority voters grown by about 2%. Uh, a year. An interesting statistic is that if uh, you reran the uh, uh, the Carter Reagan race uh, with these demographics, yeah, it'd be a, it would be a tie, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, would Carter lose by like ten points or something? Fifty forty one, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, those that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. We're we're becoming a more diverse country. We're going to continue to become a more uh, diverse country. Uh, the uh, the state of Texas, which is the you know biggest prize in the sort of base Republican constellation, uh, is a state with three million unregistered Hispanic voters. The most uh, popular boy's name in Texas is Jose, for a baby boy. Um, and uh, you know when you consider that the Republican Party lost that vote 71 to 27. I mean, you get A, a clue as to why there's more of a possibility of passing immigration reform. Uh, but B, you know, you, you, you see um, some of the challenges for them. That said, I don't think that the Democratic Party can afford to assume anything. I mean, I think we have to continue to be a vigorous uh, party. We need, to, we need to project a strong uh, argument. We have to field strong candidates, the notion that it's all going to flow to us is, is not right. Or why should any Democrat assume that uh, minority voters are going to turn out in, in the proportions for them that they did for Barack Obama? I think that that is a, well, I mean, certainly in the African American community, I think that's a, a question that needs, that, that needs to be addressed. I think if Hillary Clinton were the candidate in 2008, uh, 16. I think she's got a, tr a, a strong relationship with the community. Do you think it's more likely than not that she does run for president? 
I think it's more likely than not, but I wouldn't be surprised if she, if she didn't, you know. Um, and I think she's got plenty of time to decide. And if she did run, do you think it would more or less be a lay down hand in terms of winning the nomination? I think she would be the prohibitive favorite. I think she'd clear most of the field. I have no doubt someone would say it's worth a shot uh, and would take it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think that it would be, uh, you know, it would, it would be a, uh, an absolutely clear field. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, since we've been discussing over the last 24, 48 hours, this question about whether Obama has any juice and get, can get other things done. If, if the legislative phase of his presidency is done, if he doesn't get anything else done, would, when you think about <coughs> Obama and, and, and what he's done so far, would the most significant thing about his presidency be simply the fact that it happened? Would it be the passage of health care? Would it be the ending of um, uh, the war in Iraq? What, what do you, what do you, th what do you yes. consider most significant? No, no. <laughs> It's not multiple, uh, it's not oh, all the above. Uh, well, you know, we forget because time has passed. The situation we were in as a country when he arrived, we were mired in two wars uh, and the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And I watched him in a very short period of time make a series of economic decisions, each of which were as unpopular as they were necessary. The Recovery Act the decision to stand up the financial industry, uh, which was on the brink of collapse at the time. You're talking there about the big bailouts for the big banks and all the big bonuses to the executives? The, for the, 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 the bailouts to the banks for which the administration now from which the administration now recovered the money with interest, yeah. Um, uh, but and then the decision, you know, the decision to intervene to save the American auto industry, which at the time, you know, now it seems like a no-brainer. At the time, not even in the state of Michigan did people support it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you these, finally got around to the, what Mitt Romney was advocating all along. <laughs> these, were, uh, these, were, these were difficult political decisions. And what I, uh, you know, and I was the guy who always came in with a polling, right? That was my job. Well, Mr. President, you know, even in Michigan, blah, blah, blah. I never was, I never was recommending that he, you know, necessarily follow the polls, but I was always there to, and he almost never did. And I always say that, um, um, you know, what I like about him so much is that he listens to me so little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was certainly true about health care. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it was not a good, it was not a political, if you were just doing the, everything by the books, uh, you certainly wouldn't, as a political matter, have taken up health care. Uh, and he took it up because he felt, you know, his budget director was saying, if we don't do something about health care in the long run, to try and corral costs that um, uh, the system will implode. Uh, the burden on, on uh, the government, on families, on businesses would all implode. Um, and he, and then you had the issue of the uninsured and a sense that people were underinsured. I walked into his office in the summer of 2009, again with polling data, to say we're taking water on on the health care issue. He had just come back from a trip, and he said, I just, he listened to me intently, which is a one of, he's very good about that, which as you know, isn't always a characteristic of people in politics, listening. Um, and he said, um, when I was done, he said, I know you, I'm sure you're right, and I'm sure we are taking on water. He said, but I just came from uh, uh, Green Bay, and I met a woman who's 36 years old, she has two children, married, has a job, has insurance, but she has stage four breast cancer and now she's concerned that her family's gonna go bankrupt. And by now I felt him kind of, we were standing in his office, he's kind of leading me out of his office, his hand in the small of my back. And he said, he said, uh, he said that's, that's not the country we believe in, so let's just keep fighting. But it was not a political, you know, we said, at the beginning we said, Mr. President, this is gonna be very, very tough. And he said, yeah, but you know, if we don't do it in the next two years, it won't get done. We'll go, we could go yet another decade or two or three. And uh, he said, we, we're not, you know, what do we do? You put your approval rating on the shelf and admire it for eight years? Or are we here to get things done? So I admire him for that. Well, I'm gonna, um, so, uh, I, that, uh, so, so to answer your question, I think 
history will look back and say he did some very, very significant things to save the country from what would have been a second Great Depression. He right, did, so it he sounds did like have your first in impulse is, is, when you think about the significance of the Obama presidency, the first thing that comes to mind is sort of economic um, stabilization, right? Point taken. But I, I want to go to health care for a second because before we run out of time. Um, having passed health care reform, which no Democrat had been able to do for 60 or years. Anybody, right. Um, the, the achievement is one thing, but of course, if in implementation it doesn't work, it's a mess, people lose faith in it, it gets repealed, then it's not worth a whole lot. Tell me how concerned you are, as someone who's for it, wants it to succeed, with the complaints that we hear from you know, various people in government, Democrat, some or Republican, some Democrat, that the thing's going to be a chaotic mess. Well, I don't think, you know, it's, from some of the Republicans, I don't think it's complaints, I think it's... Uh, you know, there's snipers on every roof uh, when it comes to health care because they would like to see it right. uh, fail. Uh, Max Baucus was not a sniper. No, but... Uh, and he's not even I, running for re-election. No, but he may not also be right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that uh, uh, there are... Any time you... As the President said yesterday, when you undertake something of this magnitude, um, it is a very challenging thing to do, and it's been made more challenging because of decisions of some governors across the country, um, Republican governors not to participate at some level in it. On the other hand, many governors have, uh, uh, and legislatures have. Um, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of parts that are challenging. Getting uh, young, healthy people to enroll in these exchanges is an important part of uh, of the plan, and we're going to have to work hard as a country. Uh, to do that. Uh, you did an excellent piece uh, just the other day on uh, some of these challenges uh, that we face. But I will say that, and I think we'll get through that, and I think you'll see, you know, the state of California, the state of New York, both working very hard uh, to implement this and doing everything that is necessary. Those are significant parts of the, uh, the country. Um, I think, you know, it will be spotty in places. Mm -hmm. It will be better in other places, but in the long run, I think it's going to it's going to work well. You're, and, you're confident and, about and, it and, as and, we sit today. And and I am I am confident that in the long run, that this will be a success, and we will look back at it as a major uh, a step forward and a major achievement of this administration. But I don't think we have to look back too far because uh, already that young woman who I mentioned from Green Bay has protections that she didn't have before because those lifetime caps have been uh, lifted. People with children with pre-existing conditions don't have to look back, don't have to wait to look back because they already have uh, coverage uh, today. Young people up to 26 uh, don't have to look back, uh, don't have to wait to look back because they're on their, they can go on their parents' insurance. I mean, there are a series of things that are in place uh, small business subsidies and other things that, um, you know, so there is, there is a lot in place already that you think will this make will this turn program out to successful. A durable achievement. I, I do think it will be a durable achievement. I do think, and, and think about this, John, um, for, I, I don't want to dampen the enthusiasm of, uh, uh, of, of some Republicans who are rooting for its failure, but uh, the things that I just mentioned are in place. Um, and what, what this, this, this law is predicated on a kind of um, a, a grand bargain between the insurance industry and um, consumers. And the, the bargain is there is going to be a floor uh, that beyond which the insurance industry can't go in terms of um, uh, you know, placing caps, uh, in, in terms of excluding people mm -hmm. with pre-existing conditions and so on. Um, and in exchange, they'd get tens of millions of new customers. Um, now, the part that needs to be implemented is the part that will bring them the tens of millions of new customers. Now, I don't know politics. You know, you, you, I don't pretend to know everything about politics, and you, you, you may. Um, <laughs> but everything I know about politics tells me that what the Congress isn't going to do is um, repeal all the good things that have already been implemented. They hate to do that. Mm -hmm. 
So then what, do you, what is the answer but to make this work? Uh, I think there's a powerful impetus when people sit down and think about it, whether it's the insurance industry or our office holders, to say, you know what? We're not going to go backward. We're going to go forward, and we're going to make this work. Uh, all right, we're almost out of time, uh, but I want to do maybe three questions from the audience. So I want to uh, recognize Kevin Bryan to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to stand up so you can hear my voice. Thank you for your fascinating question. Suppose uh, Mr. Obama were to contact you and ask you what steps you to take to take back the House in the midterm election. What would you say? Uh, yeah, the question, the, qu the question was, suppose the president was to uh, remember David's cell phone number, call him, and ask him for advice on retaking the House. Uh, it's probably something that happens several times a week, but uh, what would your advice be? Well, if he called me and said, David, I want your advice on taking about the House, I would say, you must be calling David Pluff. <laughs> uh, the... Um, I think that the first thing to recognize is that there are only uh, uh, like a, a handful of genuinely swing districts, and that's a real barrier here. A and I think we have like an uphill 20? fight. Yeah, I think two dozen maybe mm -hmm. genuine uh, swing districts. That that's that that is a very narrow uh, narrow pass uh, uh, for the Democratic Party, but. Uh, they're swing districts for a reason, and I think, you know, I mentioned one area where I think, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I think that there's common cause between the president and um, uh, Bloomberg and Gabby Giffords on the, on the gun issue and some of these suburban uh, districts that are going to make a difference. I think that blind obstructionism is an interest in some of these uh, swing districts that can be worked against uh, the Republicans, you know, I, if um, uh, you know, I think that the last midterm election and um, the presidential election were largely about Obama. I think this election is going to be more about the Congress, which is terribly unpopular. But you have to focus your efforts on those two dozen districts, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, where people uh, won't necessarily uh, uh, value, um, you know. Uh, very um, uh, effete um, corporate tax breaks more than they will educating our kids, uh, where they actually feel that uh, you know climate change exists, uh, and that we may ha maybe have to do something about it. I, mean, I, I just think we have to identify those districts and work them hard, and work them hard on those issues. That's number one. Number two, um, the the reason why you have a different result. Um, in the presidential elections has a lot to do with turnout. Uh, and the great challenge for the Democratic Party is how you reduce the big gap between who votes in presidential elections and who votes in congressional elections. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the midterm election electorate is, is older, it's whiter, um, and you know, youth vote was 18% of the electorate in 2008. It was 19% in 2012, but it was only 12% in uh, 2010. So the question is, how do we motivate those voters who made a difference for the Democratic Party in the presidential year to, cons to think it is important enough to participate? And we need to use, that's where we need to use some of the technology that's been developed to really target those voters and get them involved. One, one follow-up question or related question on that. Um, is it, is it simply a, an inescapable reality of politics that because elections are binary and they involve human beings that the only place in or, something like Organizing for America, the, the political organization that came out of your campaign, the only place something like that can be effective is in elections and not in pressuring people to vote once they're in office? I'm not sure about that. I mean, that's obviously a proposition they're testing. Um, and um, you know, again, if you accept my fundamental sort of crude, rudimentary principle, which is what motivates most politicians is survival, um, you know, they will respond to the pressures that they think correspond to their ability to get reelected. 
and whether OFA can create that sort of sense of urgency uh, among office holders, I think is, a, is an but, open But can't path. you only create that in the context of a campaign and election time as opposed to during the middle of the year when Congress is about to take a vote? As if Congress isn't thinking about elections when they take no, a vote. No, no, they're thinking about it, but, but you simply can't translate the pressure. I think that, that you way. actually saw an example of the opposite on this gun vote because I think that uh, there were a whole lot of people in that Senate who knew better who simply weren't willing to take on the NRA because they were worried about their electoral chances. Right, so you in fact think that that stood for the proposition that that sort of lobbying was effective, not that it was ineffective, right. but that you got as close as you did. Well, I think that they were more effective in their lobbying because they've, I'll return to the point I made earlier, they have proven that they can take people out um, uh, who, or they, or they've, cre I don't know if they, they have created in the minds of these office holders a sense that they could be taken out if they, uh, if they voted right. against so them. Right, so in essence, they've already established part two. There's right. the pressure and then right. the taking right. out. Exactly. You guys have, are working on part one, next year is when you try to establish part two. Uh, that is that you could lose your election over this. Yeah, I mean, well, you guys, by you guys, you mean the OFA? Yes, Because I'm side. unaffiliated, my side, yes. yes. Okay, do we have a question? Right there. No, you, sir, right there. Uh, there was a lot of talk early in President Obama's administration about trying to heal or change America's, like, the image of the United States abroad. Do you feel that he's been successful in that? The question was, has the president been successful uh, in uh, improving, healing the reputation of the United States internationally? I think as to where we are now, where we are now as to where we were in, uh, when he took office, I think absolutely yes. And it's not uniform, but you look at some of the polling around the world and the impression of him and the impression of the U.S. is a far better now than it was uh, then. So, um, you know, we, you know, it's not, it's a very challenging world and, you know, a dynamic world with ongoing um, events uh, and, uh, you know, so it's, is it perfect? No. But, you know, I, I, I occasionally I look at these global numbers and, um, you know, if you compare them to where we were, uh, the answer to that is yes. Steve. Uh, thank you, Dave. Steve Clements uh, with the Atlantic. I recognize you. <laughs> Steve Clements, Steve Clements. The other night the president was joking at the White House Correspondents Center that he appreciated the role of journalists in the press. His job was to be a strong president. Their job was to humble him. His delivery was better, but. Well, first of all, I'm interested in the premise because, um, you know, 90% of Democrats did vote for us. So I guess, um, are you saying that if we had more, so if we had spent more social capital, that 100% would have voted for it? Because I don't think it was the lack of social, the lack of, of execution on social capital. Now, when I was there, you know, I saw people at the White House uh, all the time. Um, and one thing I know for sure is that when people were running for re-election, uh, we saw a lot of them uh, around fundraisers where they invited the president and others of us to help them raise money. Um, but, uh, you know, my honest answer is I think that um, when, I was, uh, when I was in the White House, um, we probably uh, spent, uh, we invested too much time in uh, the leadership and not enough t time in the rank and file uh, members of Congress. I think that's been corrected now. 
and it's a good, it's a, it's the right strategy. Up there, yes. Um, well, I mean, uh, oh, sorry, to repeat, I'm sorry. Uh, the Supreme Court has not uh, yet ruled on same-sex marriage, and um, depending on w whether the Supreme Court uh, uh, affirms or doesn't affirm the right to same-sex marriage, how's the president going to proceed? Well, look, he's you know obviously committed uh, on this issue, and we'll see what those rulings are. Um, it's interesting to me. I mean, there are things that he can do. Uh, relative to the, the federal government's uh, policies, and, and he's, he's pursuing that. And, um, you know, what's interesting to me is this um, uh, growing movement uh, in the states to, to, you know, that has taken on enormous speed. I come from Illinois. We're on the cusp, I hope, of uh, uh, being the 11th state to uh, approve gay marriage, and I think he'll be, you know, he's, uh, he's one of the reasons why uh, the encouragement that he's uh, given, the, the inspiration and the example. So, um, you know, I think he's gonna pursue every path uh, possible. He thinks it's a basic fairness and equity uh, issue. And, um, you know, I, I think he, like everyone, is, is looking forward to seeing what the court how the court proceeds. All right, let's do one more, and then I'm going to have a closing question. Let's go right here. I was dismayed uh, reading Time magazine that... Uh, Try Newsweek. <laughs> <laughs> After the November re-election, that uh, your whole strategy was laid out beautifully on how you got Obama re-elected. So I'm hoping, like a good baker, you will have left out, you, you did leave out some point so that the opposition won't copy you in 2016. Yes. The question well, was, did David spill all of the secrets of the Obama uh, re-election campaign to Time Magazine? And, you know, my follow-up question will be, uh, I wish he had spilled them to me rather than Time Magazine. We actually gave Time Magazine a bunch of misleading and erroneous... <laughs> Thank you. Bingo. It's going to take, them... take them years to find out the truth. You know, here's the interesting thing. If we had run the same race or the same kind of race, if, we, if our organization had been uh, doing the same things in 2012 as we did in 2008, we would have lost. And I see the Republican Party talking a lot about reverse engineering what we did and replicating it in 2016. The way technology is moving, at the pace it's moving, there'll be a whole new array of... Uh, tools and uh, imperatives for the winning campaign in 2016. So the question isn't, can we catch up with what they did? The question is, what is the next big thing? And, you know, my challenge to anyone running for president on either side, but certainly to my party, is don't try and repeat what was done in 2012. Try and understand where the country is in 2016. And I'd just suggest one area where I think uh, where there's going to be a greater emphasis is, is in how we use mobile phones and smartphones to communicate, send media. Uh, yes, this is a show and tell thing. Um, uh, because I think they're, they become, they're, they're, every single day they're becoming a more, more of an information center uh, for people. And it could be that you can actually send media, you know, there'll come a point where you can send relevant media directly to people's um, Smartphones on a very targeted uh, basis. So I mean, you know, but that there, are, there. Are, uh, I venture, I'd venture to say that there are half a dozen things that I can't, as I sit here, think of, and no one has yet thought of that are going to play a big role. You know, Twitter was almost not a existent back in uh, 2008, and played a huge, for better and worse, a huge role in the campaign. As you can see by the length of my answers, anything that requires 140 characters is a real challenge for me. Yeah. So. He, he did tweet this event, though. Um, OK, so I promised that my question about changing Washington wasn't simply a rhetorical statement. Um, so, so I want to close with this. You've, you've always 
uh, uh, certainly in the last few years when we've discussed it, you've always trashed Washington. I hate Washington. It's such a terrible town, which I always take as a little bit of a cheap shot as having grown up there. Um, and I think of Washington as sort of I, a... I think of you as one of the bright spots. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, let uh, me just say, I, 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 have lot, I have great reverence. You know, I'm, I am an idealist, yeah. and I really believe, even as, as challenged and sometimes tattered as our institutions are, I believe in them. I, I, I love being in Washington in the sense that I, I love the history of it. I love the meaning uh, of it. I just... You know, I don't like the pathology of it. Right. And you know, my, my mother used to say to me when I was a kid, I love you, I just hate the things you do. Yeah. <laughs> I, so that's I, how I feel about Washington. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll take that point, although I would say parenthetically that Washington looks to me just like a bigger version of Tallahassee, Florida, the state capital that I covered in Florida, or uh, Springfield, Illinois, yeah. or many other state yeah. capitals. But, so here, but here's the question. Not There's crazy about those either. <laughs> yeah. There's always been a tension um, within the, the dual nature of Obama's appeal between the substantive things that he wanted to accomplish on policy and the broader idea of uh, changing Washington, changing the way politics is practiced. Is it not now obvious, uh, five years into the presidency, that Obama considers the former, that is the policy goals, much more substantively important than the process changes and the way Washington works changes, and, and not only more important, but also more achievable. Well, John, the only thing I would say to that is that I don't think that's ever, I don't think there's been a transformation in his thinking. There may be a transformation in his thinking in how challenging it would be to change the politics of Washington, but changing the politics was always a means to an end, and the end was to move the country forward to solve big problems. Uh, and and that's not changed at all. But you've got I mean, to he's choose not, I mean, when you're I, governing. I, I, look, do, I, do I work on health care or do I work on campaign finance reform? He wanted to work on health care because it was substantively important. Yes. I, well, the, of course, because the, look, campaign finance reform, the reason that we need campaign finance reform is because um, big, powerful, often self-interested uh, interests uh, influence the debate in unhealthy ways because of all the money. But it's the debate that matters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wouldn't matter if they didn't influence uh, debates. If they didn't leverage that money, then, you know, then, you know, who cares? Mm -hmm. So it really is about, ultimately, how you move the country forward. And um, look, I think he would like, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I have this Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago that I just started. Um, and we have programs like this, and we have smaller uh, study groups with uh, uh, students, and we place them in internships and so on. But one of the most important things about it to me is to bring in practitioners from both parties to have civil discourse. Because I think it's important to, s I have great respect for people who are in the arena. Mm -hmm. There are very few people I dislike in politics. and. Um, the, you know, and, they're, and I'm bipartisan in my dislikes. I mean, there are people on both sides who I uh, dislike, but basically I respect people who mm -hmm. are in the arena because most of them are there because they believe deeply in the country and they want to move the country in the direction they think is right uh, for the country. And I think it's important to send that signal to young people that you can disagree and even vehemently disagree and yet still respect each other and still like each other. Um, and we've lost some of that, not some of that, a lot of that in our politics. And I'd like to see us recapture that. And I think the president would. I mean, when he was in Springfield, uh, despite your ad hominem attack on my state capitol, uh, when he was in Springfield, as you know, he was almost famous for, he was in the minority for six of the eight years, and he was almost famous for his ability to forge alliances across party lines. And I, I think it's been disappointing to him that it's been uh, as difficult as it has been to crack that, um, you know, pathology of Washington right now. Um, so, so now that but, you're but ultimately, it was he built those coalitions not to prove that he could hang with the Republicans. He built those coalitions in order to get things done. And the first priority for any president and for the country has to be how do we get things done? I think the frustration people have is when this polarity gets in the way of that. But uh, having talked about how he stabilized the economy and 
the financial system and passed health care and did ended the war in Iraq. What is now that you're an academic? Yeah, give me. I could give, go on, give, by the way, with that. List. I, I understand. I understand. Give me an fuel honest grade. Raising fuel efficiency standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me an mm -hmm. honest grade for ending, how successfully ending, don't ask, don't he tell. has succeeded in changing Washington. Well, or failed. So basically, you're separating issues, which is had, you asked me what he's accomplished, and mm -hmm. I can go on at length right. on that. Uh, but in terms of the larger issue of how Washington works, has he done that? Um, I think that he, in his own conduct, has uh, done that. I think there's more. I think he has been more transparent. I think he's been open with people about what he's doing, and uh, you know we, uh, you know we, we get. But he, he gets very little. He gets very little credit uh, for. But I know because I lived under these ethics mm -hmm. rules for the kinds of ethics rules that he's he brought to the White House to end the kind of revolving door that was uh, prevalent before we uh, arrived, and so on. Has he changed the overall gestalt of Washington, the pathology of Washington? Has he cracked that code yet? No. And if I said, if I said yes, that would impeach everything I said earlier in the minds of these fine people. And I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to be, you know, Pollyannish about that. That's still an incredibly uh, difficult. And in disturbing fact, if you said challenge. yes, th we might have a spontaneous May Day streaking episode <laughs> breakout yes. right here. Right. All right out the door. Yeah. Can we uh, thank David Axelrod for being with us tonight?